Well, it is a privilege to be here. Uh, we have enjoyed our time in this part of the country immensely, very different from the, the dry part of Colorado, which is where I'm from. You think of Colorado with mountains. There are mountains there indeed, but there are also dry deserts, and that's where I've, I'm from. So coming out here and seeing the lush, beautiful farmland has been uh, a, great, a great privilege, and it is indeed a privilege to, to be here with you, to worship with you. Thank you for your hospitality, for your welcome. Uh, I would invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 42 or your Bible apps, whatever you have available with you. Um, we'll be looking at Psalm 42 this morning and Psalm 43. Uh, when you're reading through the Bible and you're reading through the Psalms, sometimes it's easy to lose sight of some Psalms that are meant to be together, and these Psalms are meant to be together. So Psalm 42 and 43 will be our text this morning. So hear now the word of God from Psalm 42 and Psalm 43. To the choir master, a maskal of the sons of Korah, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before the face of God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the saving acts of the face of my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the saving acts of the face of my God. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man, deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain and to your tabernacle. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. And I will praise you with the lyre. O God, my God, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the saving acts of the face of my God. So ends the reading of God's holy word. Let's go to him in prayer. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for its power. We thank you for your voice which speaks to us through it. We pray that we would rightly understand it, that we would be rightly applying it in our hearts and in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When you read the first verse of Psalm 42, it sounds like a very pastoral picture. If it comes up on the verse of the day or if it comes up in a devotional, and you read it as a deer pants for flowing stream, so my, my soul pants for you, O God. It sounds like a very ideal picture. We might think of a deer who's healthy. He's walking in uh, green grass or a, a meadow of green trees, and he's healthy and vigorous, and he walks, and he's thirsty. So he finds a, a stream, and he drinks of it, and he bounds away. But in fact, the, the image is actually quite different. 
the image is not of a strong and healthy deer, but it's the image of a weak, a thin, a stumbling around in the wilderness deer. He's a deer who is dehydrated. He's, he's dying of thirst. His eyes are caked with salt from his tears and his sweat. He is coughing. He's panting. He's retching for water. If you've ever seen an animal that has been dehydrated, you know what that sounds like. That's, that's the panting that the psalmist is speaking of here. It's an animal who is gasping for water. The search for water has overcome this animal. That's the only thing he can think of. He's close to death. He must find water or he will die. That's the picture the psalmist gives us of himself and his soul. The psalmist is not just ready for a drink with God. He's not just thirsty. He's gasping, panting, dehydrated for God. So this is a desperate man, isn't it? It's a man that's driven to the bottom, driven to the very bottom of himself. This is his state and condition. And this really does shape how we read the whole psalm, isn't it? All that follows comes from this image of a man who's at the end of himself. He's a man under the hot sun. He's a man in a spiritual wilderness. He's oppressed by enemies without and within. And before we continue with this idea in mind, we need to understand how this psalm is working. There are several bright arrows, there's, there's waypoints that show us how this psalm is structured. And this helps us understand what the psalmist is experiencing, but also where his hope lies. So first, there's a verse that's repeated in these psalms. You probably noticed it. It was repeated three times. It's in Psalm 42, verse 5. It's in Psalm 42, verse 11. And it's in Psalm 43, verse 5. It's one of the reasons why we know these psalms have to go together. It's exactly the same. So it's repeated three times. What does this show us? Well, there's three parts of this psalm. Three sections. But second, in each of these sections, these three sections, the psalmist has questions. Questions either that he himself is asking or that are being asked to him. And there's a pattern with these questions. In section one, there's a when question and a where question. In section two, there's a where question and a why question. And then in Psalm 43, which is the third section, there is a why question. So the psalmist starts with when, and he asks where. The psalmist has the accusation from the enemies, where, and then the psalmist asks why, and then he ends with why. So three sections, and they all build together. You can think of, a, of an ocean wave that's moving in. And each wave moves the psalmist further and further along until he ends in Psalm 43. These sections build off of each other. And so we're going to consider this psalm under those three sections. In section one, the psalmist is forsaken. In the second section, he discusses how he is oppressed. And in the third section, he waits in the why question. He waits in the why. But he does find hope there. And what we'll find, therefore, is when we find ourselves in the depths, the dark waves of suffering, we reorient our heart, we turn our heart away from the why, and we turn it to God, who is the who. So let's look at that first section then, when Verse 2, he says, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before the face of God? So the first question, when? When shall I come and appear before him? The psalmist is physically distant from God's people in the tabernacle, and God's presence there. We know that from verse 6 of, of Psalm 42. So he's physically distant, but even more importantly, he is spiritually distant 
He feels spiritually far away. He has a felt spiritual forsakenness of God. And we have to remember, as we actually just confessed together in the psalm earlier in the service, in the Old Testament, the presence of God, the special presence of God was pictured by the tabernacle, the temple. That's where God and his glory had descended at Mount Sinai. He descended into the innermost part of the tabernacle and the the people of Israel camped around it. And so the picture in the Old Testament is the presence of God, the worship of God, is located at the tabernacle. And of course, we have to be careful with this. We know that God is not limited. God is not bound. It's not as if God is only in the tabernacle and and nowhere else. We can't put God in a box that way. But the picture is clear. The special presence of God where his soul yearns to be is in God's presence at the tabernacle, in the temple. That's his desire. So he's physically far away, but he also feels himself spiritually far away. And so what is his question? When? When, O Lord, will I come and appear before you? When will I come and appear literally before the face of God? That's what he wants. I want the face of God. I want to be so close to be in the very presence of God. But he doesn't have this. And so therefore, he is in the wilderness. He is forsaken. Verse 3, my tears have been my food day and night. His forsakenness leads him to weep and to cry. To be forsaken is to be alone. He's alone with his tears. He is forsaken by everyone. His tears then say to him, where is your God? Where is your God? Now, this is both a real question that we have when we're faced with forsakenness, it's also an accusation, isn't it? In fact, that question, where is your God, it comes back again in section number two. This time on the lips of his enemies. Here his tears are saying to him, where is your God? Later that will come from those who oppress him. But this is a real question. This is a real question and it's used as an accusation. But we do need to consider it both ways. Here in verse 3, it's a question that comes from the depths. It comes from deep forsakenness. What are the depths that he's in? Well, perhaps we know it. In fact, I think we all do know the depths, don't we? The deep darkness. The times in your life when you've felt forsaken by God, when you feel alone, when you are in extreme spiritual pain. The depths are when you have the dark waves that come over you of grief or of fear or of guilt or of shame. Perhaps we're in the depths right now. And the depths can come from so many different places, can they? They can come from sin. They can come from the effects of sin in the world, death and the curse. But either way, the depths are so often the same. Sometimes we're led into the depths by our sin, aren't we? And every sin actually has this potential to bring us down, the spiral that brings us down into the dark places. We think of the 14-year-old boy, for instance, who struggles alone with lust. He struggles in the darkness of his room. He falls into sin. He struggles again and again, and the shame starts pressing him down. The guilt of sin stabs him in the core, and sin scars his conscience. And he wants help, but he doesn't want help. He wants help for his sin, but he can't actually find it within himself to reach out. And so what happens? Does the sin go away? No, the sin stays and it deepens. 
So sin comes for him day after day, and it deepens and deepens. He gives into it more and more. The spiral goes down. He can't see the way out anymore. And so in the darkness, in the depths, he cries out through tears, where is God in this? Where is God? How do I find him? I can't get out. But the depths can also be of grief, the death of a loved one, the death of parents, the death of siblings, the death of children, of friends, expected deaths, sudden deaths, the depths of grief and the waves of grief lead us to that question, don't they? Where is God? And what's the answer? The answer And what the psalmist answers it as is a reorienting of his mind. Where is God in the darkness? Where do you look for him? You look for him where he has revealed himself. You look for him and you thirst for him and you desire the living God. So verses 4 through 6, what does he say? In his forsakenness, what does he say? He reorients his heart. He says, these things I remember as I pour out my soul how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. He remembers a time when he's not alone. Not only is God near, but the people of God are near. That's what he remembers. And so then comes the refrain, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the saving acts of the face of my God. What is he doing? He's questioning himself. He's reorienting his heart. The depths and forsakenness are in front of him. And he says, why are you cast down? Hope for God. Cling to God. Wait for God. No matter how deep the depths are, he runs not away from God, but to God. In verse 2, his greatest desire is to be before the presence of God, literally the face of God. And what does he say then at the end of that refrain? I will wait. I will again praise him. Why? Because I know the saving acts of the face of God, the presence of God are coming. So the refrain gives him hope, even in the depths. Hope in God, wait for God. But then as we we begin the next section, where is he at? He's back in the depths. Verse 6, my soul is cast down within me. He knows the promises of God, yet his soul is cast down. His soul is pressed down, as it were. It's, It's oppressed, and what is this? Lead the psalmist to do again. Remember God. Reorients again. Therefore I remember you, he says again, from the land of Jordan and Hermon from Mount Mizar. Far away from the tabernacle and the special presence of God, the psalmist remembers the Lord again. And by the way, isn't this how the depths work with us? We're in the darkness, we reorient to God, and then we go back in. That's the story of the depths and the deep places that sin or grief or the effects of sin bring us. But he reorients again. I remember you. Now, where is he at? This is quite interesting. He's in the land of Jordan or near the land of Jordan. He's from Hermon and Mount Mizar. Where is this? Well, if you look on a map, where he is is the uppermost part of Israel, the very, very tip top most part. He's on the very borderland, as it were, of the promised land. He's almost back physically in the wilderness. He's on the boundary. He steps away from being back in to the wilderness where God had brought his people. He steps away from leaving the promised land. Joshua and the Israelites crossed the Jordan River. They crossed the Jordan into the promised land, but now he's on the brink. The light of God's glory, as it were, is a glimmer on the southern horizon. 
The great darkness of the pagan nation seems ready to swallow him up. In fact, you could not get farther away physically from the tabernacle than where the psalmist is. He's far away from the mountain of God, Mount Zion. He's on a different mountain, Mount Mizar. The mountain of God is where the tabernacle is. He is away. So he remembers the Lord from his forsakenness. But he feels stuck. Everything in his life is, as it were, opposite to what it should be. Everything is upside down. He's on a false mountain. He wants to be on the mountain of the Lord. He's away from the God's presence. He wants to be in God's presence. He feels forgotten and alone, and he is therefore cast down. And he uses a picture that you might know quite well of how much he is actually cast down. Verse 7, he says, Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. Deep calls out of and into deep. The depths, in other words, deepen and deepen. Depths unto depths. He's not just at the bottom of the ocean. He's at the bottom of the ocean, which leads to another ocean in which he's the bottom of. You can think of the roar of a waterfall. That's the imagery he uses. The roar of the waterfall. It never stops. If you're right next to a massive waterfall, it just keeps going on and on. It crushes and it crushes. And you imagine trying to stand underneath a waterfall. Can you stand under it? No. Because the water keeps coming down. It presses you down. It presses you under. Or then he mentions the ocean waves. Wave after wave. You're cast away on the ocean. You're struggling to keep your head above the water. But the waves still come. The waves swallow over. It's a wall of water. It overwhelms you. It just keeps coming. You take water in your mouth and you can't spit it out. You can't get breath before the wave hits again. So on the one hand, he's dying of thirst for God. And on the other hand, he is oppressed by the waves of the deep places. This is the picture of his trial. But these aren't just random trials. Do you notice what he says? He says, your breakers, your waves, these breakers and waves belong to God. And this is the core of his forsakenness, isn't it? The suffering that he's enduring is not random. It's not suffering that's outside of God's control. The breakers and the waves belong to God. Now we know part of this trial is from an external enemy. Verse 9, the psalmist asks God, Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Verse 10, As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? There is an enemy that is oppressing the psalmist. We don't know who the enemy is. The psalmist doesn't tell us. But whoever the enemy is, the psalmist knows that this enemy is not out of, out of the control of God. The oppression he is feeling is not happening without God's knowledge and permission. And so what do we make of this? How do we hold these two things together? The real oppression of the enemy and the fact that God permits, allows, even providentially leads these things in our lives? It's a very important question. And there's not an easy answer to it either. And this is especially true for those who are actually in the deep places. When we're in times of calm and peace, it's kind of easy to put on our theological hat and say, oh, the providence of God. But when we're in the depths, like the psalmist, it's a whole other thing. It's a whole other thing when we ourselves are faced with the reality of suffering and the reality of God's sovereignty in our suffering. So how do we understand these things? Well, I think the psalm helps us. First, 
we need to remember that two things can be true at the same time. The psalm affirms the reality of suffering, the reality of the enemy. And the psalm affirms that God is sovereign, your breakers and your waves. In other words, the psalm presents both as real. The reality of the oppression of the enemy, the reality of affliction and sorrow of the depths, and the reality of the waves and the billows belonging to God. And this actually does give us some comfort. The Bible does not give superficial answers to things. The answer is not, there is no suffering. No. But the answer is also not, your suffering must be borne by you alone because God can't do anything with it. The Bible doesn't give superficial answers. It gives true answers. So on the one hand, we don't minimize the reality of our suffering and our grief and the depths. And we must not also minimize the fact that such suffering is not random, it's not accidental, and it's not outside of the control of God. So we acknowledge the reality of the depths that we face and we acknowledge that these things come not by chance but by our Father's hand. And this means that even the greatest enemy, the greatest and most powerful adversary we face in the world, our flesh, our sin, physical enemies that the church throughout the ages have actually faced, and even the prince of the power of the air himself, the devil, these enemies cannot and do not have sovereign power over you. God reigns and God is king. And therefore God does not stand helpless as evil afflicts his creation and as evil affects his creatures. God uses, he permits, he allows, he can even send chastisements, but these chastisements always come with the promises The deepest steps that you face are not random acts, they are sovereign acts that the shepherd of your soul with his rod and his staff is not only aware of, but is guiding and directing in order to bring you closer to himself. Under the billows and the waves, where does the psalmist want to be? In the presence of God. And therefore, the second thing that we can learn from this is that we must respond in our trials and our sufferings, not by running away from God, but by running to Him. Verse 7, all your breakers and waves have gone over me, but then what is the very next thing the psalmist mentions? Verse 8, by day the Lord commands His steadfast love, and at night His song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life even though the psalmist knows that the breakers and waves belong to God, he then immediately reorients. He immediately turns to God's loving presence with him. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love. In verse 3, we see that his tears have been his food day and night, but who has also been with him? The Lord. The psalmist feels forsaken, but God is in fact with him. And so in the midst of these trials and sufferings, he turns to the Lord himself. And therefore, the trial sent by God leads us not to a grit your teeth and bear it type attitude. It doesn't lead us to a pull up our, our, ourselves by our bootstraps type mindset. It doesn't lead to just a just get over it mindset. The psalmist is led to pour out his lament to God to pour out his suffering to God and therefore when the enemies accuse him where is your God he knows exactly where God is even in the tribulation God is with him even in the depths of grief and pain God is with him even though he feels forsaken God is with with him and God is near. And so he sings his refrain again, verse 11. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the saving acts of the face of my God. 
So we come to the final section, Psalm 43. From the deepest of the depths, where does the psalmist go now? The psalmist pleads with God to act. This is the greatest reorientation, isn't it? He's been in the depths, but he knows God is with him. And now where does he turn? Not just to cry out to God his, his sorrow, but to plead with God to act. Verse 1 of 43, Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man, deliver me. The enemy taunts him, therefore what? Vindicate God, defend my cause, deliver me. And what's the reason for his hope for God's acting? Verse 2, For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? How can, how can the psalmist on the one hand cry out for God to act and yet also ask the question why? Well, because he knows who God is. God is his refuge and his stronghold. And there's been a sea change in how he's thinking, isn't there? There's a sea change. The psalmist questions, when will this end? Why have I been forsaken? Why do I go about mourning? They are now directed to who God is. They're asked in the light of who God is. He's, put, he's taking his questions, as it were, and he's, he's pressing them into the mold of what he knows. He knows who God is. God is a refuge and a stronghold. He doesn't question that. He knows God is a refuge and a stronghold, and therefore he presses his questions now into what he knows to be true. God, I know you are my refuge. Therefore, vindicate and act, even as I still ask why. So he knows in whom he has believed. He knows who he trusts. And this is actually what Paul says, doesn't he, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort in abundance through Christ. That's where the psalmist is going. His sufferings are great, but he knows who has them in his hand, and therefore he goes to him. His suffering is not with God at his back. His suffering is with God in front, filling his thoughts and his soul. And that's the same with us as well. When we're in the deep places and even under oppression and suffering, we turn to God in our suffering. So he says, verse 3, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me where? To your holy mountain and to your tabernacle. He never lets, lets go of this desire, does he? It comes back over and over again. Send out your light and your truth, God, and let them lead me. Where? To you. Let them lead me to your holy mountain. To the presence of God. And then he knows exactly what he'll do when he's there. Verse 4, then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, O oh God, my God. His heart takes him to the altar. His heart takes him to the sacrifice on the altar. His heart takes him not just to the presence of God in a vague, ambiguous sense, but to the sacrificial presence of God. Worship with God. His heart is filled with praise. And so not only does he know who God is, but he knows exactly what God will do. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul, he says. Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. Why? Because the saving acts. The acts of God is what he's hoping for. The saving acts of God will surely come. Redemption will surely come. Salvation will surely come. So as we take stock, have all the questions of the psalmist been answered? Some have. Some haven't. The psalmist asks, 
when will I enter before God? When will I be delivered? And the answer has come, wait. You will certainly be delivered, though you don't know when. Deliverance is coming, but you don't know when. Wait, trust, hope. The psalmist is accused by the enemy. Where is your God? He seems far away. He seems to have forgotten you. He seems to have forsaken you. The answer has come. Yes, he seems far away, but he is with me. He is my rock. He is my stronghold. The psalmist asks, why? Why am I being oppressed? Why am I being taunted by the enemy? Why is my soul cast down? And the answer? Well, that's the question that does not get answered for him. But his hope and his trust is not diminished. Notice that. He doesn't get the answer to the why, and yet his hope and his trust is actually stronger than when he began. Why? Because our comfort does not come in knowing the answers. Our comfort does not come in knowing the why. Our comfort comes in knowing the who. As a deer pants with thirst, so my soul pants with thirst for answers? No. Reasons? No. Relief? No. Comfort? No. My soul pants for you, O God. And God has answered that prayer. God is with him. This is his greatest desire, his greatest comfort. He's asked so many questions, but this is actually what he has desired. And as you first read through this psalm, it seems as if God is very far away, even in reading it. Maybe you notice that. We focus so much on the oppression. But if you go back and look through all of the references to God's presence, you will start to see how God has been present all along. So think back through, and let me, let me give you these references. Psalm 42.2, he desires the face of God. 42.4, he desires to be in the multitude of people going into the presence of God, the house of God. 42, verse 6, he will remember you, O God. Psalm 42.8, the psalmist knows that God's song is with him through the day and through the night. Psalm 42.10, God is his rock. Psalm 43.2, God is his refuge. Psalm 43.1, God is the one who can and will vindicate him. At first, God has seemed so far away, but actually God has been right there all along. He just had to see it. He had to take his eyes off of his suffering, and he had to look to the God who was there. But at the same time, we need to let these why questions stick in our mind. He asks why questions more than any other question. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning in the oppression of the enemy? Why have you rejected me? And as we ponder these questions especially with New Testament eyes, where do they take us? With New Testament eyes, we see the shadow of the cross filling this psalm. We see the darkness not of the wilderness of Jordan, but of Calvary. Jesus, not on Mount Mizar, not on Mount Hermon, not even Mount Zion, but Jesus... On the Mount of Olives, in deep darkness, Matthew tells us, says this, Jesus came with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane and told his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Jesus entered the depths. In deep darkness, our Savior poured out his soul to his Father. If it be possible, Father, let this cup pass from me. In the darkness of his agony, the Lord Jesus Christ entered into a wilderness bearing the sin of his people. He entered into the forsakenness of God. He entered into the full onslaught of oppression, not just of physical enemies, not just Judas, 
but the full host of wickedness, the principalities and powers of darkness, the prince of the power of the air, the devil himself waged an all-out war on Jesus. And when Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross, he thirsted. His lips were parched, but even more, his soul, smitten and afflicted by God, he panted with thirst for God his Father, for the presence of his Father. It's on the cross that the enemy taunted and accused him, where is your God, Jesus? If you say that you are the Son of God, where is God? Let him come and save you. On the cross, the full wrath of God against the sin of his people came down upon Jesus' soul. The full wrath of God, the waves and breakers of the wrath of God passed over upon him. The infinite fullness of wave after wave of God's wrath passed over upon him. The condemnation of our sins passed over upon him. And therefore, what does he say on the cross? With the cry of one who's under the curse of God, what does he say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forgotten me? Why have you rejected me? But even in this forsakenness, we read that Jesus commended his soul. He breathed his last, but he gave his soul into the hands of his Father. So in Jesus, we see the why questions answered. Because it's not really why was the psalmist rejected and forgotten. It really is why was Jesus rejected and forgotten. And the answer is because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So this morning, are you asking why? Are you asking why this trial? Why this sin? Why this suffering? Why this grief? God may not give you the specific answer to that question, but if you belong to Jesus Christ, which you do, in body and in soul, both in life and in death, then the answer is, that all that suffering not only is not random and not accidental, but used by your faithful Father in the blood of Jesus Christ to bring you to his Son and to bring you into his presence, not just now in this life, but forevermore. So the bright hope in our dark waves is Jesus Christ, and it's because we belong to Jesus that because he suffers, we suffer. We suffer his reproach. We suffer his humiliation. We suffer because we take up our cross and we follow him. And so one theologian puts this so beautifully. He says, in Christ, justice and mercy embrace. And therefore, suffering is the road to glory. The cross points to a crown. And the timber of the cross becomes a tree of life. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? And why are you in turmoil against me? Wait for God. Wait for God, brothers and sisters. For I will again praise him for the saving acts of the face of my God. Amen. Let's pray together. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we come before you in wonder and love and praise that, O oh Father, in the cross of Christ, we see not only the reason why, but we also see our hope, a hope that is not diminished, a hope that is not diminished by any form of suffering we now experience as deep and dark as it is. Father, we pray that we would turn our eyes more and more on Jesus and that the peace of the cross and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ would come over us like a river. 
Father, we pray for all those who are in the depths this morning. We pray that you would not only comfort and console them, but that you would lead them in the body here to seek your face, for you are with them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.